Number 10, Mesoamerican Ball Game. Aztecs, Mayans, and Inca, oh my, the ball game of Mesoamerica. Today, a version of this game still exists. It's called Ulama, not Alama, Ulama. It's, trust me, it, look at the spelling, it's there, Ulama, which had its share of modern adaptations and rules over time, so it's, it's changed. It's still played amongst the indigenous peoples of Mesoamerica today, though. The original game's rules aren't exactly clear. However, what is clear is the cultural impact of this favorite pastime. A flying rubber ball is the least of your worries, as we all know how bad those can hurt. Remember gym class? I know, those hurt. Well, if you know Mesoamerican civilizations, then you know how much they love sacrifice. They love it! So much so that it was tied to the sport. Losing a game? Well, that could very well cost you your life. I love the ball game just as much as the next beer drinking dad in the stands, but no one should lose their heart after losing a sporting event. If that were the case, the Toronto Maple Leafs, well, they just wouldn't be around, would they? Number nine, gladiatorial combat. Do you think this wasn't gonna be here? Of course you did, because you guys are smart. You know who else is smart? Whoever it was that stopped gladiatorial combat. Only one in five or one in 10 gladiatorial fights ended up with combatants actually dying. But the whole thing started as a substitute for human sacrifice at funerals, so yeah, death and fatal injury was pretty common. Guys and gals who were criminals, who were enslaved, or who wanted to test their combative prowess took part in a bunch of different combative games as gladiators that would have them meet the afterlife at the pointy end of a piece of metal. It wasn't just people who met their ends in the arena either. 9,000 animals were slain during a 100 day ceremony to mark the opening of the Colosseum, for example. Look, we have combat sports nowadays 110%, but you aren't expected to die in pretty much any of them. Number 8, Fencing. I know this is a sport that we still do today, but think about it. You fighting with swords, sharp pointy pokey swords. Just waiting for a moment to pierce a private school trust fund athlete. It's a wealthy European sport. Not for a humble plaid wearing Canadian. Surprisingly though, the most common injury is sprained ankles and foot injuries during practice. A lot of the sport is placement and, and footwork, so that, that makes sense. However, it's still a sword. And yes, bad things have happened. Like in 1982, when Vlad Smirnov during the World Championships had his foe's blade break and pierced his mask. And his eyes and his brain. He didn't make it. The sports safety since has gotten much better, but still, that makes me uneasy. I'm galled. Number seven, chariot races. What could be more dangerous than being pulled by two to six horses around a giant track with hairpin turns in a light, easily breakable two-wheeled cart at breakneck speeds against about 10 or 12 other dudes doing the exact same thing? Not a lot, but that's probably why it was so insanely entertaining to watch. Chariot racing was a huge sport back in the day, not just in gladiatorial games either. This was actually part of the ancient Olympics. Guess where the best place to sit during a chariot race was? If you were there for the life taking potential of the sport like everyone else was, you'd want to sit on the turns where you'd get a good view of the tangled masses of horses, drivers, wood, and death when they crashed into each other. But don't worry, chariot drivers also whipped each other and threw each other out of their chariots, so there was violence for all to see. Number six, Hoplitodromos. What's worse than running a marathon completely stark nude in the heat of the Mediterranean sun? Running a marathon in a full set of military gear in the hot Mediterranean sun. Oh yes, that's right, shield included too. Man, that would really slow you down. And, and, and the baby powder I would need for the chafing. Oh, at least I'd smell good though. Anyways, this sport may have actually had ulterior reasons for making chiseled oiled Greek men run around in full armor. It suggested that it was just as much as a military training operation or preparation as much as it was an Olympic event. To be fair, it makes sense. A Greek soldier would have to be quick in order to get past Persian arrows. Fast enough to dodge those said arrows? Uh, probably not, but the ancient Greeks are smart, so if they're doing something for a good reason, then I trust them. That makes sense. Uh, that makes sense, right? Yeah, sure. Number five, Thebes. One of the most successful ancient cities in Egypt. At first, she was a great place to be, and at one point was estimated to have a population of 40,000, making it one of the largest. Thebes was built like many other cities in Egypt, close to the Nile River. Almost like that river was important or something. Naturally, since the city was a pinnacle of civilization, it made it a target for many other factions and issues, internal and external. The arrival of Greco-Roman rule doesn't help either. Eventually, the city deflated over time, including its economy, which for us humans is a big one. What, what no money? I'm out of here. 
Number four, Alexandria. Now this is one city I would have loved to see in its prime. Founded by the Greeks during their conquest, specifically Alexander the Great, it became one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. The lighthouse alone earns it a spot on this list, but some would argue the Library of Alexandria is much more important. My dyslexia disagrees, but my heart full of love and history tends to agree. A building containing this much knowledge is a very valuable thing to have, especially all those years ago. Thousands of scrolls were stored in the library. Archimedes himself may have invented his hand pump while studying at the library. Pretty cool. Well, where is it? What happened to it? Come on, Chad, tell us. Okay, okay, hold on. As the legend goes, a one Julius Caesar burned down some Egyptian boats that were chilling in the docks. And if you guys know fire, then you know it likes to jump from other things to burn. And it did. And now the library's gone. And now I'm here talking about it. Number three, Babylon. Okay. I take back what I said. I would have loved to see the city of Babylon in its prime. Being that this city pre-exists a lot of the Egyptian cities, makes sense as to why it ain't there no more. It was humanity's first crack at civilization. We did okay there for a minute. Famous for King Hammurabi and his code of laws, which every first year law students know at the top of their heads. There will be a test, guys, so be prepared. And of course, the mythical hanging gardens of Babylon. This is another one we aren't sure if it was there or not, but my biggest defense for the hanging gardens is the pyramids. Any expert will tell you how complex they are, so to me, it doesn't seem that impossible. Years and years of regime changes and external factors made Babylon go bye bye. It's not there anymore. You can't go there. It's not there. You don't find it. You find something else there. There's another guy there now. You never find it. Number two, El Dorado. Dios mío, toda el oro. But yes, that's right, my Spanish speaking friends. The lost city of gold, El Dorado. Well, maybe it might have not have actually existed either, but given the mouth-watering hunger the Spanish had for North American gold, they were willing to believe anything, including rumors of a city made from untouched riches. Plus, the other European nations hadn't got there yet, so this meant chalk one up for Spain. If they could find it, which they never did, because again, it probably didn't exist, so technically we lost this city quickly because it might not have existed and they needed the gold and Spain did some stuff. Number one, Machu Picchu. I choose you, Machu Picchu. I'm sorry, that was that was bad pun. I gotta make a clean joke every once in a while. You never know, someone might find it cute. We'll see. Speaking of cute and bad segues, we don't know much about Machu Picchu. There's just no written language to help us discover, well, what was going on there. What is going on here? Machu Picchu. Anyway, not a bad joke. However, there is some speculation that it was built for a king or the boss or something. I'll, I'll add to that by saying that I've played enough video games to know that the bad guys, bosses, and kings always build their layers to the top of stuff. Maybe to be closer to the gods. Maybe it was the view. Or real estate value. I'll never know. But whatever the reason, it was abandoned shortly after the Spanish showed up to Eurofy the area. Number 10. Mesa Verde. When I think of places I'd like to pop my city, I can honestly say I don't first think of under a cliff. But think about it, natural protection from the elements, assuming the cliff doesn't erode away over time like everything does, dropping huge chunks of rock on you from above. At Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado, you'll find the remains of cliff dwellings and the cliff palace of the Pueblo people who inhabited the area around 900 years ago. The Pueblo people lived for a long time on top of the top of the mesas for over 600 years and then began to move to and build anything from storage rooms to whole villages underneath the cliffs, probably for protection from the climate change and harsh weather, but I'm assuming it was to just get some well needed shade. Number 9, Samarkand. All roads lead to Rome. Well, then all Silk Roads lead to Samarkand. Or at least it was a famous pit stop along the way. No one is quite sure when Samarkand was founded. Some evidence suggests that there have been humans living in the area from at least 40,000 years ago. Long time. But one thing is for sure, both its history and finances were quite wealthy. Silk Jade and all the goods that the Silk Road offered made their way to and through Samarkand. This made the city very wealthy. It exchanged empires the same way I exchanged bad gifts from your aunt at Christmas. Persian, Greek, Mongol, and most recently Soviet in what is now called Uzbekistan. Today you can still find ancient buildings and mosques from a time long past, as that was the main religion. However, the city was also a place of culture and art, which meant for a long time there was some coexistence going on. But it's really nice amongst the different faiths. Very nice, I like. Number eight, Orkney Islands. You've heard of Stonehenge, but that's been overdone countless times before. You want something new, a different location with the added benefit of having other sites for the kids to go to and check out nearby. 
Look no further than the stunning Orkney Islands, home to the stones of Stennis, Meishau, the Ring of Bodgar, and Skara Bray otherwise known as the heart of Neolithic Orkney. Stenez is our main standing stone henge like attraction. Meishau is a lovely underground burial mound sporting some striking 12th century Viking graffiti. Skara Bray is an in ground stone built Neolithic settlement. And last but not least, the Ring of Brodgar is an even bigger circle of stones. You'll be well removed here at Orkney, situated as an archipelago right at the tippy top of Scotland with stunning views, angry Scottish neighbours and the Nordic founded town of Kirkwall. Just bring a jacket maybe. Number 7 Nan Madal. This is one I had never heard of before. Very interesting too, especially one that has been described as the Venice of the Pacific. Sometimes I'm described as that. Not really. Some even think it has connections to Atlantis. Ooh, maybe. That I'm not sure of. However, if you took a pleasure cruise with your spouse down to the Pacific, and why not? Most people can't say that they've done that, so go do it. You would find an ancient stone ruins built upon some land, and more interestingly, built upon a coral reef. A series of small artificial islands connected by canals. Ones belonging to the Saudler dynasty, I'm pretty sure I said that right, which yes, that's new to me too. Today, Namadal is a protected heritage site. So you know what, bumblebees? Don't go there and take anything that you weren't supposed to. Go look, but don't touch. I'm watching. I'm watching. Always watching. Number six, the city of Karl Supe. The ancient city of Karl Supe is the oldest civilization center in the whole of the Americas, being over 5,000 years old. You'll find this lovely world heritage site in the desert of Peru's Supe Valley, north of the Lima River. Being first built in 26,000 BC before the Great Pyramids were even built, the site itself has temples, an amphitheater, plazas, and ordinary houses. The society that actually built and lived here were apparently a gentle society, built on commerce and pleasure. Which is backed up by the fact that we haven't really found any defenses, mangled bodies, or tools of war. We did find tools of music though, specifically 32 flutes and 37 cornets. So the Andean people who inhabited this place didn't fight and they knew how to have a hoedown. Let's bring back this way of life, yeah, maybe? Number 5. Nazca Lines Imagine the confusion the first pilots, airmen, or anyone who got a good vantage point in the Peruvian desert, and to their surprise, discover some illustrations in the ground. Except, you know, they're, they're massive and no one knows who the heck drew them. Or at least its origins. Obviously it was done by some sort of ancient tribe or civilization, sure, but the grade school process of thought is an answer. And if you remember, then you remember. You know what I'm talking about. Your, your five W's. Your who, what, where, when, why, and sometimes how. I almost forgot how to count there. That dyslexia is a heck of a thing. I mean, I know how they dug these bad boys in the sand, but hear me out. In those times, there's no planes. The only way you'd be able to see them is on the surrounding foothills. But there's no evidence that these people live close to those drawings, so who were they made for? Gods? Extraterrestrials? The weird guy with the weird hair on the History Channel would tell you so. All I'm gonna say is, anything that's meant for gods and aliens, they meant for us. So keep keep an eye out in space there. Keep an eye out. Number four, Ballista Balls. I'm not sure if you picked this up yet, but uh, don't take things that don't belong to you. Great, hit the, hit the thumbs up for that common knowledge we should all have. Whether you believe in curses or not, leave things alone, and people for that matter, okay? If you want to learn more about Roman artillery, that's why we're here. Don't steal 6th century weaponry. Ever. It's a bad idea. Back in 1989, an archaeological team was brushing up the past near Israeli-Syrian borders, and the remains of an ancient Roman ballista, a massive crossbow, were found. It's exciting, but here comes the bad stuff. Six years later, researchers found ballista balls, which were sadly the ammo when it came to these massive war machines. And in 2015, these balls appeared in a courtyard outside of a museum in Israel, written from an anonymous thief, imploring others to never touch those stone balls or take them. As you know, they're, they're cursed. They're all cursed, apparently, full of bad luck. His family apparently left him, this thief, and he had to sell everything he possessed in order to just get by, including those ballista balls. He was gonna sell them and he's like, you know what, no, that's the last thing I own, I'm putting it back. Could be a curse, again, or the fact that he was the thief. Either or, both not great. Number three, Montezuma's Revenge. Yes, that's right, Montezuma's Revenge, a traveler's worst nightmare. I too have succumbed to the horrors of Montezuma's Revenge. 
And it's always when I gotta do something important, like on a movie set, or with a group of people I'm really trying to impress, especially career-wise. So the rule is that no pickled vodkachini peppers before a critical event. However, I'm talking about a different kind of Montezuma's revenge, not the bathroom kind. I'm talking about his gold. I'm talking about when Hernan Cortez and the Conquistadors destroyed the Aztec Empire. Montezuma cursed them. And that applies to his lost gold as well. Which in case you didn't know, the Spanish were after. It's pretty much all they were after. So if Montezuma can curse your family trip to Cancun, then surely he can curse a pile of his own gold and jewels. After some were dumped in the lake and others in the desert. I just wouldn't exactly be so excited to go find it. You don't know what, I'm, what might happen if you do. If he can give you diarrhea, maybe he can give you vomiting. You don't know. You don't know. I'm pointing a lot in this video. And number two, ancient mirror. It doesn't matter who you are, you've heard of this curse before. Maybe you have it. Maybe you're experiencing this curse right now, I hope not. You break a mirror and what do you get? You get seven years of bad luck. Has this happened to you ever? If so, what year are you on? I'm on four myself. How close are you to the seven year mark? Cause we got your back, okay? Ancient Romans believed that the human soul would renew every seven years. That's where the seven year thing comes into play. It's where it all started. It takes time to repair the human soul, right? Combined with the belief that mirror's reflection was the only way into the soul, well, now we have one dude in history who feels really bad for breaking the first ever mirror. Therefore, a curse has lived on. If you break a mirror, you're tearing the soul from the body and now you're abandoning it. In Kazakhstan, if you break a mirror, evil spirits will haunt the person responsible for the damage. That's a pretty horrible deal. They say you can't look into a broken mirror afterwards, like once it shatters into a bunch of pieces, because that's bad luck as well. So if you break a mirror, you just gotta do nothing about it, I guess. You just gotta be like, Ah, okay, and sweep without looking. There's too many mirrors now, I can like, cut to today. I'm sure ancient Romans had no idea what 2022 would look like. We have phone cases with mirrors on them. We're literally surrounded by mirrors. I broke a studio mirror, a dance studio mirror once. Am I doomed? I feel like I'm doomed. Number one, vampire burial. If you couldn't tell, I get a lot of my knowledge from movies, TV, and video games. It's just what raised me, that's how it goes. So you can't blame me when my knowledge of vampires comes from Skyrim and the hit young adult romance novels Twilight. You know what I'm saying? However, what I do know is that they have sharp teeth, they don't like garlic, and will cease to exist if you drive a wooden stake through their heart. However, that's kind of a moot point, as most things would not work anymore if you did that. I know I wouldn't. Some folks in Poland a few hundred years ago were not taking any chances, however. Remains found in Caldas, Poland, were that of anti-vampire graves. Basically, you bury the vampires and you leave a wooden stake in their heart just in case it wants to wake up and eat you or do whatever they do at night. I don't know, blah, 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 some of that stuff. Or remove their head entirely. No wooden stake, no problem. Just toss a couple small boulders into the hole. That way, the bloodthirsty menace can get people. You know, boy, people in the past were so kind. That's so nice. Number 10, the Rushmore Room. Built by Gutson Borglum, 1925, this chamber behind Abraham Lincoln's third eye was meant to hold documents and artifacts most significant to what makes America, America. Yeah, not country music and muscle cars, of course, but like the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, you know, the important stuff. At first, the idea was a huge inscription to be carved under the figures. It would describe the nine most important events in US history from 1777 to 1906, basically Washington to Roosevelt. They realized it wouldn't be big enough to read, so they thought up this new plan, dig out a secret room within the mountain for the records to live. A list of famous Americans and contributions to the world of science, industry, and art, all in one spot. Unfortunately, Borglum passed away before it was completed and World War II started halting construction. The unfinished hall houses 16 panels within a teak wood box, within a titanium vault, within a granite casing. Of course, not accessible to the public, yeah. Secret stuff, vault within a vault type stuff, huh? Okay. Number nine, Eiffel's apartment. When Gustav Eiffel designed the tower, drawn into the the plans, he included a very subtle, very private little apartment for himself at the very top. I mean, why not, right? Imagine that view. When he passed in 1923, he left the place in mint condition. All of his furnishings exactly where he left them. Today, the apartment houses only mannequins of Eiffel himself. He's just like washing the dishes, you know what I mean? He's just like Apparently tons of people would offer up literally a small fortune to rent the private room for just a single night, but Eiffel always refused. Apparently only Thomas Edison was granted access for quote, logical thinking. Dude, this place is awesome. I wonder if he had bugs, you know? Like if it had an elevator, it had bugs, hundo P. This place is also like eight times bigger than every university house I lived in. Like look at that ceiling height. 
This place is beautiful. Number eight, library apartments. If you've seen Goodwill Hunting, you're gonna love this next one. Apparently there's more than just bookworms that live at the library. When libraries were built in New York more than a century ago, they needed people to take care of them. These buildings were often heated by coal. Library custodians, along with their families, used to live inside small hidden apartments located above, under, and behind lots of New York public libraries. Today, of course, these secret apartments are either remodeled into storage closets or offices. Dude, can you imagine? Libraries closed, just bored, wandering down to find a new book every day? Like, you'd be a genius. That's like free school right there. I'd definitely be riding the trolleys all day long though, you know? Just like riding the ladders across the walls. There's only like a dozen of these secret libraries that still exist in New York. I'm surprised this isn't a Netflix or TLC series called I Grew Up in a Library. Number seven, Brooklyn Bridge Bootleggers. Should have been a pro hockey team. The Brooklyn Bootleggers. John Roebling designed the Brooklyn Bridge which opened in 1883. Apparently he was able to fund the design and construction with the help of liquor vendors. Okay, I can see where this is heading. Since the anchorages of the bridges and the voids between them and the walls were neither intensely hot or freezing cold, so storing alcohol in them made sense. So Roebling rented out the caverns below the entrances to various alcohol vendors in the late 19th century. All right, right around the time where they're like, should we make this stuff illegal? The bridge itself was built with tons of passages and compartments under it. They were actually rented out for storage, businesses, and apartments. In order to fund the 15 million bucks to finish the bridge, elites paid up to five grand a year to store and cool their hooch there. Imagine during the prohibition time too? Pretty pricey and sneaky stuff if you ask me. Number six, Trafalgar Square Bobbies. If you're familiar with the London area, you've probably seen this. This little post office lamp post looking thing. It's actually a fully functioning police station. One of the world's smallest, actually. According to historians, it was built in 1926 so that police could be close to the protests in the busy square. Basically the first CCTV, I guess. At the end of World War I, a temporary police box outside of the Trafalgar Square station needed to be renovated, and instead, it was decided to build a less obvious, more subtle station. Something a little invisible to criminals. So they built one inside a lamppost. It was the first to actually have a mirrored interior booed light. When we went from candles to those flamethrower lights in the UK, it had a direct phone line to Scotland Yard and all. And when the phone rang, the mirrors on top spun, just like the sirens we all see on emergency vehicles today. Like a mini bat symbol almost. It's so small too. It's now used for, of course, brooms and mops. Can you imagine? Yeah, you're under arrest. Just close the door behind you, please. Thank you. Just turn around, turn around. Number five, the plow. Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem-solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. And to the plow and the evolution of agriculture. So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number four, the calendar. No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean, clearly, if you look at the calendar, I mean, clearly it's the it's the fifth of, uh, well, I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. H hieroglyphs are hard, man, I don't know. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock, no. But they did have to tell time, and as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky, the sun. Assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. 
It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, yes. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. Number 10, Atlantis, the poster boy for lost cities and the name given to many gentlemen's clubs across the world. Yes, the lost city of Atlantis always comes to mind when talking of ancient cities. I mean, how could it not? A beautiful ancient Greek port city with straits surrounding an island, or at least this is how it was described by our boy Plato. And pretty much everything we know about the sunken city comes from him. Was it really a wonder of the ancient world? Was it really anything like he describes it? Or anyone describes it for that matter? Maybe, but we're not even sure. We're not even sure if it really existed beyond Plato's writings, to be honest. There have been some evidence to suggest that a city of its likeness existed near Spain, but calling that concrete proof is like saying, I've never once had a beer in my life. It would be beyond me and the boys to crack open some cold ones. I've never done that. And I'm definitely not gonna do that this weekend. You guys wanna have some beers or what? Number nine, Troy. Remember when Brad Pitt was Brad Pitt? I know, right? I don't know what it is, but he's just not the same dude anymore. Maybe he got old. The ancient city of Troy, besides being portrayed in the 2004 summer blockbuster, is famous for its legendary war, featuring Troy's least favorite equine guest, the Trojan horse. If we're to believe what Hollywood says about history, and why not, they never get it wrong, the Trojans were having an issue breaking down the walls of Troy. It's some good walls. Some nice, that's a nice wall, you know, good walls. I don't know. They had some good walls, so to get through that, they built a giant rocking horse on wheels because that's a very comforting gift to give someone, right? Who doesn't love a rocking horse? It's a little creepy. Well, little did the people of Troy know that there was Trojans hiding inside. Hence, the Trojan horse was born, or the act of doing a Trojan horse, if that makes sense. Whatever it was, it was a slaughter, and this may have something to do with the city's disappearance. I don't know. Maybe it was Brad Pitt. Maybe it was uh, Orlando Bloom. He was in that movie, and there was another guy in that movie, I think. It's an okay movie. I don't know. Orlando Bloom's kind of cute. I don't know. We'll see. Number eight, Mesa Verde. The Mesa Verde cave dwellings are a sight to behold. Given for its age and the remnants of the Pueblo civilization, they are well preserved. Structures and houses that are dug into the cave dwellings in southwest Colorado. This is one I actually didn't know about. So today, I'm having fun and learning. Something my grade 11 English teacher was all about. Shout out to Miss Middleton, you're, you're the best. I miss you, you're the best. Sadly for the people living in the caves of Mesa Verde, they did not have such a cool teacher to tell them what's up. Because if they did, they probably would have been more careful. As a serious drought, lack of prey, and a good old fashioned sickness pretty much wiped them out. Yeah, no good. But no one is 100% sure what happened. What we do know, however, is that they left some sweet structures behind. Cowboys looted the place when it was rediscovered in the 1800s, and Miss Middleton was one of the only teachers to let me be me in class. And that's just awesome, so thank you. And the cowboy, if people want to see more cowboy, you're all right, partner. <laughs> Number seven, Pompeii. 
Oi vey, this is a bad one. Pompeii, one of the crowning jewels of the cities that made up the Roman Empire. And truth be told, it's on my travel list. Always wanted to go there. You got Romans, you got togas, and you got one of the worst, if not the worst, natural disaster of the ancient world. Imagine being the guy who finds a skeleton under fossilized volcanic ash, which for most people working in that line of work would say that's a good day. But imagine how those guys felt when they found the whole lost city of Pompeii underneath all that volcanic ash. Great success, as the story goes. People were chilling in Pompeii. The Mediterranean paradise that it was was completely cut off guard when Mount Vesuvius bited all its liquid hot magma and busted an eruption so bad it destroyed the city within a short amount of time, covering the people in hot ash that must have felt like the mud bath from hell. Literally. There's still yet more to be discovered. I think they found like a restaurant or something and there was like some still paint on the walls. It was pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Number six, Petra. Red Rose City, as it's called. Petra is an ancient city located in Jordan's Southwest Desert and most of you probably know it because of Indiana Jones. I know, it's okay, me too. I'm not gonna pretend I actually know everything. That's the best Indiana movie, no cap. You may also know it from Civilization games. I was never a fan of settling cities in the desert. Not enough resources for me. Pop culture references aside, Petra is a beautiful piece of history from the ancient world. Despite being full of sand, Petra shows evidence of a great water conduit system, which you kind of need since you are in the desert. It was thought to have been completed around 312 BC and rediscovered in the 1800s. Not by cowboys, though, different people this time. I gotta say, though, it must be a great feeling to discover a place of lost history like that. And it weren't no cowboys, it would have been, been British, it would have been, oh, right, and what's that? Something like that, I don't know. Number five, the Celtic Warriors. The warriors of Celtic Europe. A lot of facial hair for number five. A lot of tall lads with long hair and thick beards. Nice. They were fans of being nude often when they were fighting. And to be fair, when you're covered in hair and tattoos and all this stuff, when you're literally a Viking, yeah, show it off. Battle naked. I don't care. I can't even paintball, let alone fight in a war. So I'm not one to talk. I'm not wearing jeans going in here. I would act like Jason Momoa the entire time if I looked like this. Celtic warriors included women. Women would be ranked the same, if not higher. That was the best part. The Romans were thrown off by Celtics. Unspeakable amounts of horn blowers and trumpeteers. These jacked naked warriors would shout battle cries the entire time they were rolling in. So yeah, it was alarming. It was pretty jarring. These mighty women would just punch your head off. It was amazing. Number four. The Sacred Band of Thebes. This next ancient elite military unit comes from ancient Greece. The Sacred Band of Thebes was of course a Theban army made up of 150 male couples. In total, there were also 300 men with this unit. The general, Pilopides, led this elite army and they remained at the top from 278 to 228 BCE. The army fell as a unit later on during the Battle of Caronia. They all refused to surrender and continued to fight until the very last of them fell fighting off Alexander's attack. They were buried on the battlefield and later on, the Lion of Caronia was erected over their grave. Later on in the 19th century, when excavations were done to the site, 254 skeletons were uncovered, all laying in seven rows. Yeah, I feel like we don't hear about this 300 often enough, so had to throw them in this list, of course. Number three, Vikings. Like I said, been playing a lot of Assassin's Creed Valhalla lately, and let me tell you, they're crazy. They are absolutely wild. The first official Viking raid took place in 793 AD. These Viking raiders left such a huge mark on history that we refer to this time period as an age, like we do the Middle Ages. We refer to this as the Viking Age. It officially lasted from 793 to 1066, the year of the last big Viking battle. They departed from agrarian pagan Scandinavia. Settlers and traders rolled up to England. They arrived in Lindisfarne, and then from then on just, you know, invaded hundreds and hundreds of settlements. Not, not the best way to go about things. English kings ruling over coastal seas needed to start making defense plans from these seagoing pagans everybody's talking about. Everyone had their own army and they're like, that's just people with beards. It's always guys with beards naked rolling up, causing trouble. Why are they always naked? Number two, the Han Dynasty. Going to ancient China for this one. The Qin Dynasty sprung into chaos in the late third century BC after it collapsed. It was a mess until rebel leader Liu Bang came from Han and reunited the empire. Now it was common for men to enroll into two years of military service. You had to. All the while, there's a standing army guarding the northern border. So it was tight. As far as military alignments go, it was pretty secure. The weapons used during the Han Dynasty was honestly fascinating. Crossbows and more often than not, a double-edged sword. So yeah, it looked pretty badass. So with all this power, the Han Dynasty grew over the following four centuries before it collapsed once again. And finally, number one, Combat of the Thirty. The Combat of the Thirty took place during the Breton War of Succession. This was back in 1351. With many of these armies, they're always made with the toughest soldiers from all around. The mightiest warriors of all 
over, that's it. So at some point, these battles must have been a spectacle to watch on one hand, right? Like as I'm explaining this, you're like, oh man, I really wanna see what it's like to see a naked Viking fight another dude. Yeah, kind of, it's curious, it's, it's interesting. That's why we're here. The combat of the 30 was arranged beforehand. Both sides had 30 champions, as you would have guessed, and they were all made of the best knights in all of their land. The best of the best, you're now representing us. 30 v 30. Then they all decided to meet at the battlefield at Brittany, and then they got it done in an organized fashion, which is pretty odd considering how things have gone historically prior. One side represents England, the other France. This event, and I say event, because it pulled in a crowd. Drinks were served throughout the audience. This fight lasted a long time. And in case you're wondering if anyone stood around and watched these epic battles go down, yeah, most likely. They ended up taking breaks, like a sporting event. These battles would last so long, they needed to take breaks and intermissions and like talk to fans and be like, all right, fight's going good. This dude lost an arm, he lost a foot, but eh, we're doing our best. Like a sporting interview, you know what I mean? Eh, 110%, you know, just giving her. That was the reality of it. By the end of the whole thing, the English surrendered after losing nine nights, so. Still bad, it's still all bad, although it's interesting that people were, you know, gathering to watch. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Ring of Sekinianus. One ring to rule them all. And by rule, I mean curse you and your entire family for ages to come. Yeah, this 12 gram gold ring for starters was massive. It was beautiful. Its diameter was 25 millimeters. So unless you were wearing some mighty gauntlet, she might slip off. Big old ring. It's like a big onion ring, but a little bit, a little bit more haunting. The ring had first been found in 1785. A farmer was plowing a field in Silchester Village, which is a village west of London, known for its, you know, grim history, as are most of these things on this list. In 45 AD, ancient Romans invaded that site, and come the seventh century, it was completely abandoned. No one was left there. The ring was mighty. It had an inscription on it as well, a Latin inscription. Of course, always Latin. It read, Senecion vivas in diem. When 1929 rolled around, new details surfaced, or resurfaced rather. The data from the ring matched an excavation that was done in the early 1900s, less than 100 miles away, a place called Lydney. That's where this ring is from. That's the OG. That's the OG site. At the same site, however, a tablet was found recalling the Celtic god of healing and hunting and how his favorite gold ring was stolen. In case you're wondering why this rings a bell, Lord of the Rings was inspired by this legend. The tablet also says, may he who bears the name of Senechianus not have health until he brings the ring back to the Temple of Nodens. So, if you've got it, let's go. Number nine, the Crystal Skull. Honestly, I'm surprised we haven't talked about this more. A lot of Mesoamerican stuff today, but damn, they got a lot of curses and jinxes on all their stuff. And in reality, that's not fair. All a guy wants to do is loot and pillage other civilizations' treasures, just like my ancestors before me. Nice. <laughs> Maybe. Well, besides being the second worst Indiana Jones movie, yeah, I said it, I like that one better than the Temple of Doom. Now, if you didn't sit through an hour of Shia LaBeouf, and honestly, I don't blame you, basically the skulls are like a Pokemon or Dragon Balls. You gotta, you gotta catch them all. Only then, you will receive a wish where a ghostly outworldish creature will grant you said wish. In other words, this is what a weekend at Vanessa's Hudgens house looks like. I don't know, she said she can talk to ghosts, so. The only ghouls that she's talking to are the people who think High School Musical holds up as a theatrical release. Seriously, try watching that movie now without cringing yourself into the bottom of a liquor bottle. Speaking of ghosts and liquor, you can buy alcohol in the shape of a crystal skull, because we are modern humans and we don't take ancient warnings very seriously. We will probably feel the wrath of the crystal skull, all thanks to a Canadian Ghostbuster. Number eight, Pompeii artifacts. Once a thriving, beautiful city in ancient Rome, Pompeii was sadly destroyed in 79 AD. This time, it wasn't humans responsible for the massive loss of life. What do you know? It was actually Mother Nature this time around. Hmm, she got one. Nice. The eruption of Vesuvius buried the ancient city in volcanic ash. Thank you, it took nine tries. Little do you know, viewer. Excavation didn't begin until much later, during the 18th century, and after a century of careful excavations, the city was finally reopened again to the public. Finally, yeah. Just the place you wanna go, hey. Every year there's many reports of lootings, locals, tourists, you name it, everyone wants to steal a little piece of Pompeii, literally a little mm, just in their pocket. Yeah, as if raining volcanic ash wasn't bad enough, now there's thousands of people literally stealing your land. Piece by piece. Pompeii archeological superintendents get over 100 packages a year of said stolen fragments. They return them. Yeah, thieves will send the artifact back with a little note explaining how sorry they are and how it's caused extreme bad luck in the household. Again, might have something to do with the fact that you're a thief, but hey, who knows? <laughs> Maybe it's that one time. That's why your marriage failed. Number seven, the pharaohs of Egypt. It was said that any thieves who dare enter or disturb the slumber of the deceased kings shall be cursed 
and perish. Well, this applies to archaeologists too, unfortunately. Howard Carter, the famed archaeologist, and his team back in the 1920s had come across the discovery of a lifetime finding the tomb of King Tutankhamun. You probably heard of him. And kickstarting the study of Egyptology. For anyone in the sciences out there, you know how exciting this is. Trouble is, some folks on Howard Carter's team started to feel a little under the weather. Maybe it was all the excitement from their discovery. Maybe it was the hot African sun and the dry desert. Or maybe it was the curse of the Egyptian pharaohs. As some men on his team perished from blood diseases. That's just not okay. So what's the lesson here? Maybe leave these places alone before it starts raining frogs? Huh? Think about it. I don't want that. Number six, the Koh i Noor diamond. Another list, another cursed diamond. Here we go, buckle up. The Koh i Noor diamond translates to mountain of light in Persian, which sounds beautiful, but all that glitters is not gold. A Hindu legend says those who wear the diamond will own the world, but will also know all its misfortunes. 186 carats, this thing was a pure beauty. Of course, it was passed ruler to ruler, century after century at that point. The earliest account actually is 1628. The diamond was first in the possession of Mughal ruler Shah Jahan. But once his own son had him imprisoned, the diamond later went to Iranian ruler come 1739. Nadir Shah invaded, taking countless lives, as well as the Koh i Noor diamond, all their jewels for that matter, not just the one. It was horrible, but later on, he was taken out by 15 of his own officers while he was asleep. Come the 18th century, Queen Victoria had possession of the diamond after being used in the Treaty of Lahore, but Queen Victoria wasn't a fan of the shape. Yeah, she's like, eh, it doesn't really fit with my gauntlet to snap people away. So she had it recut. So now it's only 105 carats. It's a little <laughs> smaller, but it's still beautiful. Since then, the diamond has only been worn by British royal women, or else we'll explode. Number five, Vasa shipwreck. Back in 1628, the Vasa sunk within 20 minutes of setting sail, and it claimed the lives of 30 souls on board. Pretty tragic. The Swedish Navy launched the ship August 10th, 1628, and at this time, it was considered a high-tech warship. It was referred to as spectacular. Yeah, they even said it with that accent. Spectacular. I don't even know what accent that was, but they said it like that. So what happened here? Well, the first rush of wind caught it off guard, made it all off balance, and the second rush of wind completely sank it. No combat, nothing. No icebergs popping out of nowhere. It just sank. There was a crowd around watching the entire thing. They were watching this great, glorious send-off. But the 64 bronze cannons that were installed, you know, during the rushed process to make it look spectacular or whatever, they were too heavy, so the ship sank. The lack of oxygen in the water allowed for its rediscovery to continue its story. The Vasa was built with carvings all around the king at the time, who was King Gustav II. So when the wreck was rediscovered in 1961, I say recent, this is pretty recent, 95% of the wood was still perfectly intact. Yeah, I had to talk about this, this is amazing. Humans are focusing too much on naval warfare rather than if the ship can actually, you know, stay afloat. I can't tell if this is a curse or just humans being humans. Number four. Luxor Tombs. Oh man, I wish this happened while I was in high school. I would have done so many projects on this as it unfolded. That would have been sweet. Back in 2014, quite recent, archaeologists discovered a 4,000 year old tomb from the 11th dynasty tucked away in, you guessed it, Luxor, Egypt. That's like the ultimate find right there. A Spanish archaeologist found the tomb belonging to the leader from the 11th dynasty. And it was pretty obvious this was somebody from the royal family. Officials believe the tomb may have been used as a mass grave, you know, due to the large amounts of human remains found inside. That's definitely one way to tell. That's for sure helpful. It's important to note that this tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty later on because tools and utensils from that time were also found that were not in existence from prior. See, humans can share, even mass graves, sometimes. Number three, cursed tablet. Super recent discovery right here, small but mighty. This tablet comes in at just two centimeters by two centimeters. Discovered only a month ago in the West Bank, this artifact has historians scratching their heads because it's a couple hundred years older than any Hebrew texts. It predates the Dead Sea Scrolls by 1,350 years. So it's pretty old. The ancient letters meant to call God onto anybody who breaks this curse. This little, this little curse. There's around 40 proto-alphabetic letters, early Hebrew writing, all folded onto this little lead tablet. The fact that this small tablet mentions the curse of Yahweh is pretty alarming. Like, what are the odds that we found this exact part? This sediment comes from excavations done in the 80s on Mount Ebal, so many believe this is from the ancient stone structure, Joshua's altar, which is dated around 1200 BC. Yeah, a little tablet from the Mountain of Curses. Yeah, just what we need right now. Awesome, keep it up, guys, great work. 
Number two, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Israel Antiquities Authority believe they have found the oldest woven basket in history. This basket comes from the Neolithic period, some 10,000 years ago, which is pretty impressive. This basket is made of woven reeds. It predates pottery in the region, and due to the area's hot, dry climate, the basket was able to stay in remarkable shape all this time. It was a pretty nice find in something called the Cave of Horrors. Yeah, I'm not even making that up. It's called the Cave of Horror. Sorry, correction, horror. One singular horror not horrors. Back in the 60s, the remains of 40 people were found from a long, long time before. So it makes sense that they didn't rush back to the cave to search for anything else. Now cut to March 2021, fragments of a Dead Sea Scroll were found in that same cave, the Cave of Horror. The writing on the scroll are mostly Greek letters with some in Hebrew. Dead Sea Scrolls in a Cave of Horror. Yeah, sounds like I'm making this up. I wish I was, I'm not. And finally, number one, ancient Greek shipwreck. The oldest shipwreck discovered in the Black Sea, and you would never guess by looking at it. Looks brand new, looks like it just left four days ago. This ship is from 400 BC. It's an ancient Greek trading vessel. It's not very large, but somehow this thing is mighty. It has been in great condition for over 2,400 years, over a mile below the surface. Yeah, no light, nothing. Even the fish are like, what is that? The lack of oxygen actually preserved the ship. That's why it looks like it sank a year ago and not, you know, thousands. John Adams, principal investigator with the Black Sea Archaeology Project, describes the finding as something he never thought was even possible, let alone something he'd witnessed in his lifetime. That's why we had to finish in our number one spot. Only made sense. Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam and bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow-covered state. <laughs> nice. Now, with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins. Simple. That's it. That's bowling. <laughs> Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number eight, papyrus. I heard Egyptians like paper. Well, you're gonna be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange. I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number seven, black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you gonna use to write on it? Ink, you're gonna use ink, obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron-based compounds as well as blue, green, white, and yellow. 
It was a colorful place, and they were likely a colorful people. Number six, the haircut. A little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue-eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. It kind of did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men. We just look better with them. We look, we look good. It's a good look. Number five, can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home sense signs your mom hangs up in a the kitchen, then there's gonna be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, Ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of tomb KV-5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV-5 was not studied very well, and in 1995, it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who, as we know, had over 100 kids. So, the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far, we've only confirmed six, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number three, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that, as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship the complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon. That would be the rule of Amonhotep III. Amonhotep IV is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive, with an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. Number one, King Tut. The man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chillin' in his tomb? 
Yeah, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb however was pretty well untouched, and because of this, we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think a sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful, I love it, it's good aesthetic. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Knife Armed Man. In 2018, while researchers were excavating a 1,200 to 1,400 year old necropolis in northern Italy, they made a gruesome discovery that led to us learning a super interesting story of someone who lived all those years ago. Inside this necropolis, there were the remains of a man, but what set him apart from the others is that he had a knife blade prosthetic arm. Further analysis of his bones showed that his arm had been removed via blunt force trauma. Normally, all those years ago, Ago, the wounds would have killed you, if not from the loss of blood, then from infection because of course this was a time before antibiotics, but somehow this man managed to survive it all, and in doing that he made himself the scariest prosthetic limb I've ever heard of. He replaced his missing hand with a long knife buckled to his arm with leather straps. In our number 9 spot today we have KV55. This is a tomb that is referred to by a number rather than a name because we don't actually know who lies inside of this tomb. While this tomb had its modern discovery in 1907, we still haven't quite found the answers surrounding this mystery. To make things a little more eerie, while the walls of the actual tomb are bare, which is bizarre, as you walk down the steps towards the tomb, you'll notice there are some markings leading up to it. You'll see inscribed on the wall of the entrance the words which can be translated to, the evil one shall not live again. If this wasn't enough to give an unsettling feeling, the coffin inside of the tomb has been desecrated, with part of the face having been removed. So all in all, we don't know a lot about what's going on down there, but it doesn't seem good. In our number 8 spot today, we have Man E. Okay, so normally when you're out in the field searching for mummies and tombs and all of that sort of archaeological business in Egypt, the containers or vessels that the past people are put in are decorated or contain some sort of drawings or writings. So in 1886, when Gaston Maspero, who was the head of Egyptian antiquities, came across a plain burial box, he was a little intrigued as to what could be inside. This box had no information as to who the person inside may or may not be, but the corpse inside was wrapped in sheepskin, which was apparently considered unclean by the ancient Egyptians. When unwrapped, it was revealed that this person had both their hands and their feet bound, and as he looked towards the face of this person, he found what appeared to be a screaming face looking back at him. Back in 1886, we didn't have the same amount of information as we do now, so of course this quickly freaked researchers out and led to everyone believing that this person must have been tortured to death. How scary that must have been. But luckily, with the things we now know, we have a much less horrific answer, thankfully. If the jaw of a person isn't strapped shut, when a body is mummified, the jaw naturally falls open, thus this horrible screaming expression. The real mystery that remains is how this mummy, who clearly wasn't considered a person of royalty, came to be buried alongside kings and queens. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Black Granite Sarcophagus. In 2018, archaeologists in Egypt found a massive black granite sarcophagus in Alexandria, Egypt that dated all the way back to 2,000 years ago. Rumors immediately started swirling about what this sarcophagus might have contained, but the best way to find out? Well, you have to open it, of course. Instead of some crazy curse being unleashed, the first thing that escaped this tomb when opened was a horrible unbearable smell. Apparently it was so bad that the site had to be evacuated for a while before they could return to finish opening it up. When they finally were able to completely lift the lid, they found a red brown like sewage water flooding the bottom, which is likely where that horrible smell was coming from. Other than all that gross stuff, inside the sarcophagus were the bones of three people. Unfortunately the mummies did not end up being well preserved, so only the skeletal remains were still intact. It is believed that the people inside may have been soldiers from the time of pharaohs. This is believed because one of the skulls had a crack in it from an arrow. There was a bust found along with the tomb, but unfortunately due to time past, it has been weathered beyond recognition, but that is not the only way researchers can find out where the soldiers are from and what time period they lived in. 
In our number six spot today, we have the Inca mummies. In 1976, researchers found two mummies at a burial site in northern Chile. These two corpses belong to two young women who were the victims of human ritual sacrifice. It is likely that the sacrifice they were a part of was one that was carried out by the Inca to commemorate either historical or political events, or as a response to a natural disaster. The mummies were found wearing silver ornaments, and they were surrounded by ceramic vessels, and they were wearing red robes. The red in the Inca clothing was often created using hematite or other iron oxides, but upon further inspection of these mummies, it was revealed that the their red clothing held something much more dangerous. The dye used for their clothing contained cinnabar, which is a mineral rich in mercury. This was often used in the ancient world as a pigment for makeup, clothing, and painting, but handling it leads to mercury poisoning. What is strange is that researchers believe that the toxicity of cinnabar wasn't known in ancient Peru, so we aren't exactly sure why they used it in the first place, but it's thought it might have been used as protection against grave robbers. Number 5. Inguni Stick Fighting I remember when I was a kid, me and my brother would fight each other with sticks in the backyard. He hit me in the pinky one time so hard that my nail fell off. I think, as revenge, I'm going to learn the martial art of Inguni Stick Fighting and ask for a rematch. The Zulu people would essentially dual wield sticks, or have a stick and a shield, and they would just go to town on one another. Now, honestly, this, this one ain't so bad. You ain't really seeing deaths here. The worst people get are massive scars that they wear as badges of honor. But when I flash back to the amount of damage I have sustained from ruthless stick-based attacks in my childhood, ah, I'm gonna actively avoid that kind of situation going forward, I think. Number 4. Jousting They say this is what made King Henry VIII go mad. He had a wee bit of a spill during a jousting match. And look, I'm not here to tell you what's good and what's not about contact sports. I'm a Canadian. Our national pastime is a sport that didn't have fighting in it at first, but after a bunch of Canadians had one too many rye, the proverbial gloves came off. When it comes to hockey, we'll feed you the right left bud. And while jersey in the dusty center on the home team might be dangerous bud, jousting is literally a whole other sport. Bud. Horses running at close to top speed mounted on top a knight in almost full armor, or sometimes full armor, with a long dangerous pole. It's simple, just knock the other guy off of his horse without causing any serious life-threatening injuries. Easier said than done. Like I said, it might have done King Henry in. I talked to the chief. He was refing a hockey game and said, that's not it, bud. Number three, a fisherman's joust. You know what seems like a fun time? Hopping in your favorite boat with your best buds, going into the Nile River and beating each other with oars and long pointy sticks. What makes the ancient Egyptian water jousting even more fun would be when it would get pretty bloody, and blood in the waters of the Nile means crocodiles and hippos, both of which will de-life you faster than you can say toot in common. The game, like lots of other blood sports, was played out in front of comfortable, rich overlords who would laugh and cheer as you were torn limb from limb by angry water creatures. Romans actually had something somewhat similar, where they'd fill a coliseum with water and have naval battles against teams of captives who were sentenced to be de-lifed, and these were usually way more fatal than most other gladiatorial games. Number two, rooster throwing. There was another name for this sport which immediately caught my attention because I thought it was something totally different. and it, it's it's not what I thought it was, sadly. Well, basically, for this one, you get a rooster. You tie it to a pole and you throw things at it until dinner is ready, because it'll probably be ready for dinner since you've thrown so many things at it. I don't have to tell you how cruel that is. This was a group event, too, because if you weren't with a group, it would be kind of weird. Imagine walking down a secluded alleyway and there's a dude with a chicken tied up to a pole and he's just hitting it like Mike Tyson hits a punching bag. You'd back up real slow and far away from that situation. Personally, I'd recommend bowling, a sport that makes you look like you commit crimes, but not actually doing them. Number one, shin kicking. What the hell? Why? Why? Why was our idea of a fun old time to grab each other by the throat and ruthlessly kick each other in the shins until one of you hits the dirt? No, no, I don't like it. But then I find out they first did this heinous act of combative entertainment with steel-toed boots. They train by hitting themselves in the shins with hammers. Am I missing something about this? How is this fun? Please explain, someone. I, I feel like I'm getting mad at the fact this exists. You know what? It's even something that people still do. There's a damn world shin kicking championship. Andrew, tag me out, man. I I've had enough. I'm done. Come here. Thanks, pal. 
Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Carol. An American history professor named Paul Kosuk was absolutely fascinated by ancient settlements, like I'm sure a lot of us are. But this passion led to him devoting much of his time to studying in Peru, which has such an incredibly rich history. In 1948, while in Peru, Paul made the discovery he had been waiting for when he came across the dry remains of an ancient city. The remains were carbon dated and placed to be about 5,000 years old. The city of Carol was once the home to around 3,000 inhabitants pre-Inca, and this was already a thriving location while the pyramids were being built. That is how old the settlement is. It appeared to be quite a peaceful place as there were no obvious signs of battles or weapons, but among the remains were homes, plazas, temples, and even an amphitheater. It is said that the city was abandoned in 2000 BC, and in 2009 AD, it was made a World Heritage Site. In our number 9 spot today, we have Iram of the Pillars. This place is also known as Atlantis of the Sands, and it is a lost city or area that is spoken of in the Quran. In the Quran, it is said to be a place that is full of lofty buildings, and it was populated by a group known as Ad. This group had turned away from Allah, so the prophet Hud was sent to summon them back. The people did not listen or obey, and as a result, it is said that they were punished with a sandstorm being sent to the area for seven days and seven nights. In the end, the city is said to have vanished beneath the sands as if it never even existed. In the 1990s, a team, which was led by Nicholas Clapp, who is an amateur archaeologist and filmmaker, announced that they had found this lost city. It is said that this was done using NASA's remote sensing satellites, ground penetrating radar, and images taken by the Space Shuttle Challenger. These tools gave them the opportunity to see old camel trade routes and where they all once converged. This point is a well known area, and once excavated, it is said to have revealed the area known as Iram of the Pillars. In our number eight spot today, we have Heracleon, also known as Thonis to the Egyptians. This was an ancient city that was located near the mouth of the Nile River. Greek legend says that this was the city where Hercules took his first steps into Africa, as well as the place where Paris hid Helen before the Trojan War began. This is all to say that, to legend, this city was super important. But aside from legend, no one knew where this place was or how to find it. Well, just over 2,000 years ago, it turns out that either an earthquake, a tsunami, or a combination of the two hit the city and submerged it underwater. It used to be believed that Thonis and Heracleon were two separate places and that they were both located on what is now Egyptian mainland, but neither of those things turned out to be true. In reality, in 1999, after five years of searching, archaeologist Frank Gaudio located the ruins of the city underwater as they had been submerged in the ocean. Since then, excavations and explorations of the ancient city have taken place, and it was stocked full of some incredibly cool treasures from thousands of years ago. In 2010, a type of ancient Nile River boat was found here, and even not too long ago, in August of 2021, it was announced that wicker baskets that contained fruits of the doom palm tree, as well as grape seeds that date back to the earliest 4th century BC, had been found among the ruins. In our number 7 spot today, we have Arctic Hyenas, changing it up a bit to ancient remains. Only a few years ago, scientists discovered teeth. Ancient teeth? from Arctic hyenas. When you think of hyenas, you wouldn't ever imagine that they once roamed over Europe and Asia, but five million years ago, that was normal everyday life for these bad boys. Remains of these Arctic beasts have been found mainly in the Yukon permafrost. Evolutionary biologist Jack Zhang studies prehistoric carnivores, and he knew within minutes that these recent Yukon molars belong to Arctic hyenas, aka Chasmaporthets. We'll go with that. In our number six spot today, we have the Crusader Sword. Get your goggles on for this next one, folks. We are going deep. I found a few shells in my life, but never a sword that once belonged to a crusader knight. That's just next level. An Israeli scuba diver, not even that far experienced, ended up stumbling across one of the coolest discoveries in 2021. Shlomi Katzen was diving off the Carmel coast in Israel when this peculiar shape caught their eye. As if a crusader sword wasn't enough, the diver also found anchors, ancient stones, pottery fragments, all from around 900 years ago. I wouldn't even notice this. It's covered in barnacles. I wouldn't even dare go near it to begin with. Kudos. Great catch. Number five. Hattusa. Rejoice my late 90s PC gamers for I bring another point in your honor, the city of Hattusa of the Hittite Empire. Before this list, my only knowledge of the Hittites came from Age of Empires. I swear man, every time I start up a random scenario and just looking for a little 1998 nostalgia, the Hittites come up and attack me before I can get my walls up. It's the worst. 
Well, this makes a lot of sense actually because the Hittite Empire was one of the first civilizations to reach the Iron Age in real life. Hattusa was the capital of said empire. Today, the very beautiful ancient ruins can be found near Turkey. So the question is, how did such a strong empire fall? The answer was the Assyrians. Over time, the Assyrians conquered more and more until Hattusa kind of just was depopulated. There's been some interesting finds at the sites as well, such as two sphinxes that the international community got into an argument over whose museum they should sit in. What's the lesson in this one? Well, nothing lasts forever, and maybe wait till they build my walls to attack me. Just wait, dude. Just wait. Number four, Volubilis. Whoa, what's this? Another World Heritage Site? During the first century of both BC and AD, the city of Volubilis in modern day Morocco was a cultural mixing pot. First settled by the Berbers and eventually became the chief inland city of the Roman Empire province that was located here, which I will totally mess up the pronunciation of, so I'm not gonna say it at all. People of both the Islamic and Christian religions would come here trading, living, and creating beautiful mosaics for over 10 centuries, and it became the capital of Idris I, founder of the Idris dynasty. The parts of the city that we have discovered so far include an aqueduct, thermal baths, and a triumphal arc. And they're all in pretty primo condition given all the crazy weather, earthquakes, and multiple different inhabitants over the year. It honestly seems like a place a lot of people should have heard of. Maybe I'm just the only one who hasn't, I don't know. Number three, Antioch. Boy, lots of learning today. And judging from the comments, you guys like learning from us, so thanks guys, that means a lot. Thank you so much. Besides a Monty Python skit about a hand grenade, I hadn't heard about Anatoc. I, who would have thought? I know. Sometimes referred to as the cradle of Christianity, it played a major role in Christianity and its longevity. Founded by one of Alexander the Great's generals, the city was in a prime location and benefited from all sorts of trade routes. Like the Silk Road, for example. Surprisingly, the city grew so much it even began to rival Alexandria, with an estimated population of 250,000 at its peak. Whew, that's a lot of people. It was a happening place. Sadly, it pulled to Detroit and went from a very profitable city to, uh, well, a not so popular one, as natural disasters like earthquakes and a declining trade made the city a not so happening place. All I know is that you pull the pin and count to three, not two. Three, and certainly not five. I do know that. Number two, Darren Kuyu Underground City. Hey, uh, honey, I, uh, found a hidden room behind the basement wall, and, uh, you're not gonna believe this, but it leads to an 18-story deep 7th or 8th century underground city used by around 20,000 people as a defense against invaders with ventilation shafts, waterways, stables, churches, and storage. So I, uh, I think the value of our house just went up. Yes, back in 1963, a local man in Cappadocia, Turkey, who was renovating his house stumbled upon an entrance to this massive underground labyrinth of chambers, shafts, and corridors that goes over 85 meters deep into the ground. It had huge stone doors and everything from schools to wine rooms for people to use as a defense against invasion and religious persecution. We don't actually know which civilization built this city, but it once connected to many other underground cities that have been discovered in the area with miles long tunnels. It's honestly the coolest thing I've ever heard of, and I may need to plan a trip. Speaking of, have any of these sites maybe made the travel list for any of you guys? Let me know down below. Mm. Number one, Leventa. Mesoamerica, cool place, lots of treasure, and home of La Venta. These ruins are located in the spicy Mexican state of Tabasco. Constructed by the Olmecs, one of the oldest civilizations in the Americas, La Venta was a civic and ceremonial center. As a ceremonial center, there are tombs, mounds, and ceremonial offerings. Strangely enough, there's a pyramid as well, and some statues that have big head mode cheat enabled. Big heads. It seems Leventa is a strange mishmash of little sites and artifacts, also including mosaics, altars, and some strange rock formations. All these lovely artifacts were not discovered fully until the 1950s, so it makes you wonder what else we've lost the time in that thick jungle. Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestors since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters, approximately. So yeah, 
It was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number nine, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone. Pretty, pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically, it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt. More specifically, translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English. Or, since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word. But then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number eight, Khufu's ship. When pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140 foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number seven, Mummy Workshop. Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well-preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop, you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that, I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Because, you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out until she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about the stuff. That's not a joke. I, I seriously do. But you know what? I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number six, construction manifest. You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? You know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm hmm The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. It basically said, the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days, and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. Number five, St. Mark's Crypt. Beneath the presbytery and deep inside the chapel sits a crypt, one that for centuries has been the home of St. Mark himself. St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, one of the most visited churches in the world. Every day, thousands of tourists visit to admire the mosaics and marble it houses inside. A true masterpiece and celebration of art and culture. And old. In 1063, the construction of an ageless crypt to hold the remains of the evangelist Mark. The ruins of previous buildings were transformed into a single 
crypt in which the new basilica would be built over top. When the body of St. Mark was found, it was placed with full honours inside this crypt and built over. In 1563, the Brotherhood moved inside the church and in 1604, the crypt was officially sealed and closed forever. Dude, I've seen the Crypt Keeper, alright? I'm not going down there. No way, dude. Are you serious? Like a thousand year old bones? Number 4. Club 33. I know what you're thinking. Hey Kyle, where's this rager of a nightclub located? Well, it's uh, <coughs> a little complicated. You see, it's above the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. For real. You see, we're really getting into some secretive stuff now. Club 33 is the official Disneyland members only lounge for dining and drinking. And I'm not talking like a fast pass for rides or anything. Not even the elites had memberships. It's hidden within an attraction next to Walt Disney's actual apartment. The entrance of the club was at 33 Royal Street, hence the address plate with just the number 33 on it. People never even notice the club because even if they do, the chances of being invited behind that door, it's next to slim. After Disney's death, the demand was lifted and those willing to pay a small $50,000 initiation fee and of course $15,000 annually per person are implored to visit. All that to drink like a gin and tonic out of Chip from Beauty and the Beast? Yeah, I'll pass. Number 3. Lake Erie. Lake Erie is harboring a huge ancient secret and has been for the past million years, which not a lot of people know about. I didn't even know about this until today. Something absolutely massive under the water was found. And it's not Bessie or those freshwater dinosaurs. It's salt. Yeah, lakes aren't salt water. Kyle. No, 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 but they most certainly are. See, underneath Lake Erie is a highway long salt mine. And I say highway long because, like, you need to merge and, like, signal down there. It's so big. The Salina Formation is the source of rock salt beneath Cleveland. It's located at the bottom of a 1,500 foot thick section of limestone bordering 11 counties under Lake Erie. Every day, the five mile wide mine gets even bigger. Football field by football field as crew sticks explosives in the walls and blasts the salt loose. Dude, for real? I'm shook right now. Just think, next time you're fishing, just think at the bottom of that. Yeah, there's trucks and a highway under there. Huh? Number two, hotel tracks. Track 61 is an abandoned Metro North station located under the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. What makes this place spookier than New York City's other abandoned train stations is the fact that it's right under such a famous and bustling hotel you would never even know. Only accessible by one locked door on 49th Street and using private rusted elevators. Dude, I'm picturing the Bat Cave right now. Like, for real, right? I'm disappointed. Like whoever owns this hotel, if you're not Batman right now, what a waste. Apparently President Roosevelt would even use this track back in the day for protection when visiting New York City during World War II. They built special elevators so that presidents could drive in and out with cars right up onto the train. Okay, again, we're sure Roosevelt wasn't Batman, right? Like, cause like this is the Batcave, right? And number one, Drum Castle. In 2013, archeologists came across something that people apparently have missed for like the last hundreds of of years, a secret medieval chamber and bathroom under one of Europe's oldest castles, Drum Castle, Scotland. It lies in Aberdeen and was built in the 1200s. It was gifted to William de Irwine in 1325 by Robert the Bruce himself. While working on a conservation project for Scotland's oldest kept castle, a wee tiny room was found perfectly preserved, equipped with the original toilet seat and all. Dr. Jonathan Clark from the FAS Heritage led the excavation. Trapped for centuries, a secret medieval chamber. The archaeologist then also discovered a second hidden chamber in the same tower which, legend says, is where Mary Irvine hid her brother for three years after defeat in Battle of Culloden. Yeah, English versus Scots. That was a scary time, you know? People getting stretched to death and stuff. <sighs> Gross. Kicking off our list at number 10, the Varangian Guard of Byzantium. This first ancient army was one of the more recent, so, you know, figured I'd start with this. They were formed at the end of the ancient world, right at the beginning of the medieval period. Yeah, I figured that was a fair starting point, then we'll reel it back a few hundred years or so. The Varangian Guard was made of Norsemen, the mightiest of the mighty, might I add. They all had banded together to guard the Byzantine Empire, the East Romans. They served from the 10th to the 14th century, and they were originally assembled to serve and protect Emperor Basil II. They were made up mostly of Norsemen, but also Anglo-Saxons from England as well. Just the toughest dudes from all around, really. Just people you don't want to fight, essentially. What made this army so frightening, on top of them being comprised of, you know, the strongest Norsemen, were the weapons that they held. Sometimes single, but most of the time they were double-bladed battle axes. 
double-bladed battle axes. Uh-oh. In 1204, when the Fourth Crusade attacked Constantinople, the Rangians had to defend the city walls for two days straight until Venetian ships arrived and set the city on fire with incendiaries. That ought to distract and, you know, disturb. The guard was subsequently wiped out, and the last time history referenced the Vrangian guard was in 1395, when some were working in the administrative department rather than the military. Number nine, the White Company. They should have been called the Fright Company. Ho oh boy! In the 14th century Italy, there were free companies, which were basically bands of soldiers from all over. They were English, Hungarian, German, Breton, you name it. The first unit came together in the 1360s, but when Sir John Hawkwood, an English veteran who served in the Hundred Years' War, a knight, came along to lead the White Company, well, that's when things got strategic more or less. This is when they went from a free company to one of the most elite mercenary armies in history. All it takes is some good leadership, you know, and maybe a couple knights. They were known for their skills with a longbow, and they were also known to attack during foul weather at night. So no, you will not see them coming at all. They were right between two warring cities. So between 1363 and 1388, they would fight with and against the Pope, depending on, you know, who's paying for their services and what we're paying exactly. Even when nothing was going on conflict-wise in the world, they would just raid towns for fun. Again, during awful weather or at night, so you wouldn't see them coming. This is this is a scary one. I anything with archers at night, that's that's scary for me. Number eight, the immortals of Persia. Well, there's a name right there, the Immortals of Persia. Let's talk about them. The Immortals were in power from 550 BCE to 330. The Immortals were guards of Persian kings throughout this time. They were profound bodyguards and elite battle reserves. Again, strongest people you can imagine. This unit was mighty powerful and they were known as the 10,000, because yes, power comes in numbers. They played a significant part in the invasion of Greece and the team was always 10,000 strong. No less, no more. If one of these immortals were to step out or be forced out rather by sickness or death, another was chosen right away. So this army stayed strong over all those years. Always 10,000, that's a hard number to keep up. Number seven, Egyptians. We've looked at ancient Egyptian culture up close here on Bumblebee, but we haven't touched on their ancient armies yet. Of course they had to fight. You can't have all this beautiful land and boom as one of the first major civilizations in history without having a few people try and sneak in and steal some goods. The Haskos people who were located in Northern Egypt, they were actually the first to become organized and they took over Lower Egypt at one point with chariots and weapons. It was a whole spectacle. The Egyptians learned from this, made their own army, and this time they had archers, infantry, charioteers, the whole package, and then, well, they succeeded. And they lasted for quite a while. We're still talking about them. Number six, the Spartans. Yeah, we had to mention the ancient army of Greece, the Spartans. This is Sparta, what's going on? Every boy in Greece, when they turn six or seven, they learn military training and education all at the same time. It's called the agage. Every male Spartan would leave their family and then go train with other boys to grow into this full-time ancient army, this ancient warrior, right? It's like Hogwarts, but not nearly as fun. Less magic, more push-ups. One of the first lessons these boys learned was a dance called the Pyriche. It was to teach these young warriors how to be light on their feet whilst carrying heavy equipment. I wish I learned this carrying groceries growing up, would have helped a lot. But then at age 12, then there was the Merakion, or the youth. That was, that's where their physical training would really pick up at this point. Once they turned 18, well then they were full on soldiers. But all these strict rules were then in place, so they couldn't even talk to anybody else in the marketplace until they were 30 years old. So again, they were training and busy until they were 30. They couldn't do anything, there was barely any freedom. Plutarch was the first to say it, but really the only time a Spartan warrior was able to rest, more or less, was during war. As ironic as that sounds. In our number five spot today, we have the Phaleron Delta Necropolis. In 2016, during the construction of a new library and opera house in Athens, Cruz accidentally stumbled upon this necropolis, which is a cemetery that is the final resting place of more than 1,500 citizens from ancient Greece. And while this is most definitely an eerie discovery and a reminder of our own morality, the horrifying discovery came when they found a small chamber within this one, and inside there were more than 80 skeletons that all had their hands shackled above their heads. How's that for a horrifying discovery? I don't know, I'm gonna say pretty good. Each of these skeletons belonged to people who died young and healthy, and while the exact cause of death is yet to be determined, all signs are pointing to some kind of mass execution. Right now, the best theory as to who these people may have been is that they may be some of the people who were a part of a coup in 632 BC that was led by Cylon against Athens. It's just strange that even after these people passed, they didn't unshackle them, but that might just be a mystery destined to stay a secret. 
In our number four spot today, we have the Ancient Curse. All right, so of course we have to have a good old fashioned curse that was unleashed from inside of a tomb. Okay, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but there really was a curse found on the inside of a tomb. This tomb was the tomb of a pharaoh's official who was thought to have lived around 4,000 years ago during Egypt's sixth dynasty. It was an above ground tomb that was shaped like a rectangular box. Inside of the tomb, they found a curse inscribed that warned anyone who dared to disturb it. The curse, roughly translated, states anything a trespasser, quote, might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It then goes on to warn the trespasser of his knowledge of spells and secret magic, and it threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing ghosts. These kinds of curses have been found in other tombs, and while they certainly are nothing like the ones depicted in horror movies about mummies, it might still be a little unnerving to those unearthing this discovery. In our number three spot today, we have the Lothagam North Pillar Site. One of the most incredible archaeological finds in Kenya led to a... Well, it wasn't exactly a horrifying discovery, but it certainly was unexpected. Around 5,000 years ago, a tribe of herders paused by a lake in what is now Kenya in order to bury their dead. This ended up turning into one of the most massive and monumental construction projects Africa had ever seen, which is no easy feat. For 450 years, they dug into the bedrock, piled up slabs of sandstone, and buried their dead for generations with ritual ceremonies, and this led to what researchers now consider the earliest and largest monumental cemetery in Eastern Africa. Here's the one kind of unexpected thing that they found here at this site, though. Along with the bodies of those who had passed, researchers also found 405 gerbil teeth at the site. As it turns out, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for this, and it's because they were used to make a headpiece for just one of those who had passed away. This site might not be as large and tall as some of the other monuments like the pyramids in Giza, but what makes them the most remarkable is that this site was made by the people for the people. Not for emperors or kings and queens, it was for tribe members of every age and gender buried alongside each other. In our number two spot today, we have the tomb of Hatshepsut. This was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of Egypt, and she was the second historically confirmed female pharaoh. She was an incredibly interesting person who we really could talk about all day, but we are here talking about tombs, so let's cut to when hers was found and unearthed. There were a few interesting things found within her tomb, but the real horrors came after when they began to examine her remains. They were actually able to find a cause of death for her and can actually attribute it to something she possessed they found benzoprene carcinogenic skin lotion with the pharaoh, and it is believed that this gave her bone cancer. It is likely that she poisoned herself accidentally while just trying to soothe her skin. Being diagnosed with something like that with the help of modern medicine is already a horrible and painful and scary thing. I couldn't even imagine having to go through it all these years ago without any kind of treatment. In our number one spot today, we have this ancient mystery. Okay, so this is one of the coolest things I've ever heard, and it has me rethinking my entire career. Maybe I do want to be an archaeologist after all. Basically, researchers have found a 1,300-year-old Chinese mystery, and where did they find it? In a Tomb Raider shaft. This feels like a Hollywood blockbuster, and somehow it's just real, ancient life. While excavating a tomb in China, the team discovered the skeleton of a young man that was riddled with wounds, giving clues as to how he died. The man is estimated to have been about 25 years old, and it is thought that he was harmed and then thrown into the Tomb Raider shaft while still alive, which is absolutely gruesome. It is believed this crime took place between 640 and 680 AD. It appears as though he wasn't a thief because the shaft had begun to be refilled with soil by the time of his death, so we really aren't sure why this young man met such a cruel fate. As a true crime enthusiast, this is absolutely fascinating, and I wish we could find some answers to bring this guy's story full circle. Sometimes, though, these things are just destined to stay a secret hidden in the past. Kicking off the list at number 10, Pompeii Chariot. Yeah, nothing like finding a sweet ride from ancient times. Once a thriving, beautiful city in ancient Rome, Pompeii was sadly destroyed in 79 AD. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius buried the ancient city in volcanic ash. Excavations, of course, didn't begin until much later, during the 18th century, and after an entire century of careful searching, the city was reopened to the public once again. All was lost during that fateful eruption, but we're slowly, slowly recovering more and more. For example, 
A 2000 year old chariot is pretty sweet. The decorations on the side are quite beautiful. They look like flower decorations, and according to Eric Poehler, who is a professor at the University of Massachusetts, this chariot was for the highest class. He calls it the Lamborghini of chariots. <laughs> I still can't drive. Nice. Number nine, Pompeii restaurant. Table for eight, perfect. Another addition to the list has to be another find from Pompeii. This is the first time in history where hot food and drink eatery has been unearthed. Yeah, in case you're wondering right now, fast food was also tempting the finest back in the first century. Yeah, we found a restaurant in 2019, but we were too busy talking about the Avengers to care about it. The meal of the day was most likely honey roasted rodents. Yeah, that's our best guess. Archaeologists have gathered clues to find out what 12,000 people were rushing to eat every single day. Honey roasted rodents, nice. Rolls off thy tongue, some would say. In typical human fashion, the restaurant is now open again. It's the, the same place. Yep, don't forget to tip. It's bad juju, please don't tip. You have to tip, you have to. Number eight, Turkey Gladiator Arena. Ah uh, yes, another arena, another staple in history filled with gruesome combat in the name of entertainment. An 1800 year old arena was discovered back in 2020. We were all still, you know, inside watching Ozark. Meanwhile, a 90 meter wide amphitheater was found in the ancient city of Mastura. Its purpose was thought to be the same as the Colosseum. Just, you know, a lot of bad stuff. It was to host these massive professional gladiator fights with a lot of wild animals. They were involved doing bad stuff. This was around 200 AD when the Severian dynasty was ruling the Roman Empire. If betting on animal fights was your thing, you'd have to travel to this place. This is where you'd wanna go. Yeah, hope you have trail shoes on and great knees. Ugh, I'm getting weak just looking at those hills. My patellas are like, no, I don't wanna go. Can we go to Rome, please? Number seven. The Great Treasurer. Ta and Wish had a pretty sweet job back in 1200 BC. He was the head of treasury under Ramses II, aka Ramses the Great, the third pharaoh of Egypt's 19th dynasty. He once ruled from 1279 to 1213 BC, and about a year ago, we found his royal scribe's tomb. And it's pretty fancy. It's, it's very fancy. The site also includes tombs of other statesmen from the 19th dynasty, of course buried in Saqqara, Giza. In typical tomb fashion, Cairo archaeologists found writings and drawings that tell us more about Egypt's time under the ruling of Ramses the Great. And it looks nothing like any of the graffiti we have today. <laughs> Where art is gone. Na like natural history of art and stuff, it's just we've lost that. Now we have Twitter. That's how we're going to be remembered by. Twitter and sporks. That's all we'll find in thousands of years. Number six, the lost city of Heraklion. Before it was discovered in 2001, the ancient city of Heraklion was barely mentioned in texts throughout history. Yet archeologist Frank Gaudio still found it. What an OG. It was hiding in the depths around seven kilometers off the coast and it was pretty obvious that it was an ancient city because well, there were 64 shipwrecks and 700 anchors and 16 foot statues just hanging about. One vessel was around 80 feet long. It was a classical Greek flat bottom ship, flat bottom ship, with oars on both sides and a massive sail. It was a bit hard to find this wreck seeing as it was hidden. It was hidden 15 feet under the collapsed temple of Amun. Good problems, I'd say, you know? Like, ah, oh, there's treasure in the way of finding that treasure. Where do I even start? A project led by the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology, <gasps> a lot of words, obviously kept searching, so they also found a fourth century Greek funerary area. Yeah, ancient graveyards underwater. Guy, watch a movie. This is how you get cursed. Let's move on. In our number five spot today, we have toxic waste. Despite what Smash Mouth preaches, all that glitters is not gold. Sometimes we find ancient swords and sometimes we find literal barrels of waste. This dump site here was first discovered off the coast of LA, 3,000 feet deep hiding in plain sight. These ROVs found roughly 27,000 barrels of toxic waste. This feels like a Simpsons episode. It's absolutely insane. What a horrible discovery. The 2021 find was deemed staggering. Yeah. That's a word you can say, for sure. In our number four spot today, we have Mohenjo-Daro. This is a location whose name is said to roughly translate to, quote, Mound of the Dead Men. This is one of the world's oldest urban settlements as it was found and built somewhere around 2600 to 2500 BC in what is now Pakistan, but it was abandoned in the 19th century BC as the civilization that called this place home declined. For almost 4,000 years, this site was seemingly forgotten about and the remains of it were undocked 
documented until an officer of the Archaeological Survey of India, R. D. Banerjee, visited the site in 1920 and found a flint scraper which convinced him of the site's history. From here, excavations of the site began, and as of the 1980s, it was named a World Heritage Site. In our number three spot today, we have Wolverine Fish. Hugh Jackman, if you're watching, this one's for you. This year alone, there have been over 212 discoveries of brand new freshwater fish. We love a new fish. That's super exciting. One of which is the X Men inspired Hopalin Cistrus Wolverine. These fish have strong lateral curved spikes called odontos tucked under their gills. They can extend and jab their prey with prongs. Hence why the name Wolverine is added to the fish's name. It's kind of cute, it has the claws, which is terrifying, sure, but he's okay. I do kind of love him. In our number two spot today, we have the million year old plant. Back in 2019 in Greenland, a preserved fossil of a million year old plant was discovered. This was found under the ice near a secret Cold War military camp. An ancient flower found at a Cold War military camp. What a headline. In 1959, Project Iceworm was underway. I have mentioned this before. And that in itself is a pretty bizarre frozen feature in history. Eventually, the project was scrapped and it was abandoned, but cut to 2019, it was rediscovered and scientists at the University of Vermont found parts of a million year old plant. Not what you'd expect to find under a secret Cold War base. You know, the fragments were so well preserved that it looked like it had died recently. Not, you know, a million years ago. Studying these plants can provide clues on our future and where our current plants might just end up. In our number one spot today, we have Ice Age art. Well, to end off this list, we have some ancient artwork. This Ice Age masterpiece was painted in the Colombian Amazon. The thing is, unlike other drawings found on the ceilings of tombs, this canvas stretches about eight miles. It's incredibly long for an ancient painting. And for a modern painting, now that I think of it. These drawings date back to 12,000 years ago, near the end of the last Ice Age. These were found in 2018, but it was only last year when they went public with the findings. The findings being paintings of elephants, giant sloths, horses, snakes, birds, and deer. This is now one of the largest collections of rock art in South America. Yeah.